Um, so my name's Sam Newman. I work at ThoughtWorks. Uh, probably should get some things out of the way first. I'm not Brett from Flight of the Concords. That's definitely not me. I do know all the lyrics to Sugar Lumps and a lot of the lyrics to Business Time as well. Uh, but I do require a lot of free beer before I'll uh, share either of those things with you. Um, I uh, work for ThoughtWorks, as Mike mentioned. We're a custom software delivery company. We've got a booth. You can come and hang out and win a uh, backpack that will charge up your iPhone. Although, in northern European weather, it might take a little bit longer than the five hours it claims. Uh, we also do a few products. We've got a tool that does uh, uh, sort of uh, user case management systems, agile tracking stuff called Mingle, uh, an acceptance uh, test scripting tool called Twist, and a tool called Go for continuous integration and continuous delivery. I will not mention these tools ever again. If you want to find out about them, you can come find me afterwards. They're all awesome, but that's as much as I'm going to say. Um, and we're also hiring. Uh, we're kind of uh, always hiring. Um, but I'm really here to talk to you today about why, uh, well, firstly, why rapid release is important. Uh, why do we want to be able to release our applications faster than we did in the past? Um, and, and a lot of this is sort of coming out of the lean startup movement and everything else, but it's, it's as much as anything else, it's about we are writing software. We're writing software for somebody to go and use. And the idea is, is that they, it's hopefully going to be something they want to use and use well, and they're going to give us feedback about it. So we're constantly wanting to get our software in the hands of our users faster. Because then we know, does it really work? Can we get real world data about how effective it is, about how many machines we need? Um, most of you, I suspect, work in something that's web facing. I mean, I know some people here do work in embedded systems. There's probably a couple of people here that work in guidance for rockets, for all I know. Uh, but for most of you, you have the ability to release to your client base much more often than you already are. I'm not going to dwell too much on this point, but uh, uh, if you're interested in some of the business drivers behind this, uh, there's lots of other sessions on continuous delivery on at the moment. Um, I'm really here to talk to you about this, though, which is the criteria that influence design. Typically, when I'm working with a client and we're talking about the existing architecture of their system and how to drive it forward, or we're talking about designing a new system, we're thinking about constraints and principles. We're thinking about what the system needs to do. And so we're thinking about these criteria, and lots of these they often call the illities. So uh, maybe the scaling. How do we want to scale our application? Maybe with the latest zombie Farmville, Plantville mashup game from Zynga, and we need to deal with the thundering herd from Facebook um, so that when people start throwing sheep at me on my MyFace page, that I can scale to handle the load. So maybe I'm worried about linear scalability. I might be worried more about durability. Maybe I'm the Danish medical record system, and I need to make sure that my prescription records are being stored safely. And so I might have to think a lot in my design about data replication, about durability of service. I might think about geographical constraints. I might have legislative requirements that mean that my physical hardware that serves the site needs to be in the place where I'm doing business. People in the gambling sector have these sorts of issues. You might have to have your kit in Gibraltar, in Germany, to do business there. And compliance, obviously, fun. Some of you might be unfortunate enough to work for a PCI level one organization and have to jump through lots of hoops. You might worry about the technology. What technology are we going to build our application in? Is it going to be a Ruby on Rails stack? Is it going to be .NET? Uh, performance. These are the standard things we think about, consciously or unconsciously, when thinking about designing the system that we have you know, for the problem in front of us. But what about making it easy to release our software? How often is something, that something we consider a problem? Most of the time, it seems to be an afterthought. For many of the clients I work with, they've been developing a piece of software for one or two years. They get the first release out, and then find it takes them another six months to get the next release out. And often, it's because they hadn't considered the aspects of their architecture, or the design of the system, that make it easy for them to release software. We're going to look at three things, really. We're going to try and look at design characteristics that make it easy for you to make the change in the first place. We're then going to make it easy for you to deploy that change 
And then we're going to reduce the risk of the release to your, to your users, your customers, your, you know, your front-end desk if you're in a trading house. And these are the three things we're going to look at today. Let's imagine an example. Let's take an example. Here I am with a music shop. Uh, it's a very great site. It's an awesome site. Uh, but we found a bug with it. Uh, namely, I got, put a Metallica album in my shopping basket, and the recommendation system uh, keeps suggesting I go and buy Robbie Williams and Justin Bieber CDs. Now, clearly, there's something wrong, fundamentally wrong, with the recommendation system. Um, but nonetheless, the rest of the site is doing quite well. But I need to make a change, and it's a small change. Maybe it only impacts one part of the system, a very small part of the system. Maybe it's as small as a couple of lines of code. Maybe it's a logic condition I've got wrong. But nonetheless, a big monolithic system like this, that small change, to deploy it, I effectively have to redeploy the entire system because it's one big box. So it may have been quick for me to make the change, assuming I had, say, good unit test coverage, to find the problem, implement a test to fix it. But the impact of that deployment is quite large. So take a different situation. Let's imagine now my music shop is actually a collection of components, services. Then I need to make that same change. And maybe the size of the change is exactly the same. But the impact of deploying that change is sort of fundamentally different now. The impact and therefore the risk associated with that deployment is significantly reduced. And if you think about the fundamentally, this is what we're going to be talking about today. The same change has very, very different impacts in terms of what happens when I release it to my customers. Uh, there's another aspect here as well. It's not just about making small changes and making those changes have a limited impact in terms of releasing. It's also about freeing us up to make small incremental changes. If I want to make a big change to a system, what I want to try and do is actually phase that large change to a system, building it up over multiple releases. The nice thing is every single one of these releases that I make, every single incremental deployment into my system, it's a rollback point. That's a great risk management strategy, risk mitigation strategy. Now I can release a small change knowing if something happens, I can quickly roll it back. But I also gather a load of data. Maybe halfway through this cycle, I decide I don't actually need the big thing I thought I needed. And if I'm releasing these things frequently in small chunks, I get very good at the release process. So releasing small chunks frequently helps me reduce the risk, helps me learn information, learn, learn about my system, how it behaves. And so really, we want to be aiming towards small incremental releases. So what do we need to do for our design of our system to allow this, to allow these small incremental changes? Well, let's take our big music shop. How do we go from the big box to the little boxes I showed you earlier? Well, let's imagine one scenario here. Here I am, my big music shop, and I've started breaking up my system into a series of jars, maybe shared libraries. So here, I've got my recommendation library. Uh, this is the part of the system with the problem where it keeps recommending uh, Justin Bieber to me. Um, I've probably also got some invoice creation library. Maybe this is a third-party library that allows me to do PDF generation, useful things like that. And of course, this is a Java program, so I have to have a string utils library to do useful things to strings because Java doesn't let me do useful things to strings. Now, there's some benefits to this approach, going from one big monolithic code base now to shared libraries. Uh, for a start, it becomes easier to reason about where functionality might be in my system. When I'm thinking I've got a problem with the recommendation system, it's probably in the library called recommendation.jar. You can hope, anyway. Um, it can also enable, actually, quite fast CI turnaround cycles. So if I need to make a change to the recommendation library, I just need to run the recommendation library tests, and then maybe the tests of the overall system as I integrate it. But I wouldn't necessarily run all the unit tests for, say, invoice creation, the string utilities library, those other things. So that's beneficial. I mean, so I've, I've made it easier now to make the change. 
There's a problem with this approach, though, when it comes to actually deploying it. So here I am. I've got version 134 of my recommendation library in production. I find the bug. We make a few fixes, a few performance improvements, and I now want to release my library into production. Now, if I'm in a Java shop, for example, this is effectively a statically linked library at this point, uh, unless you're just throwing jar files into your uh, uh, servlet container, uh, or you're using JBoss, in which case it will just randomly pick up a jar file anyway. Um, but at some point, I then need to go and release that change into production, so out goes version two. I still have to release the whole of that music shop web application to get my new, shared, uh, my new version of my library into production. Um, and effectively, this is because it's a statically linked library. So I haven't necessarily reduced the impacts of the release into production. Let's think of a different scenario. Let's now think of the recommendation system as a separate service. What happens when I want to release a change to that new service? Well, all I do is I deploy it, and then I redirect a link. Now, this is a configuration change of the music shop. Yes, I will need to have in, done an integration test before I deploy it, but in terms of impact to the running system, my music shop could stay up during that transition. If my music shop can stay up during the transition to the new version of the recommendation service, I'm reducing the risk. I'm reducing the impact to my users. I'm reducing the impact to my business. But we can do other things in this situation. When I deploy the new version of the recommendation service, if I can run them side by side, I get to do other things. I might want to run some smoke tests on it before I actually make it live. I may want to actually run a showcase, go and eyeball it. And I can do all of these things while the rest of the system is running quite happily. I've deployed it into a production system. Now, I couldn't do that if I was deploying a new version of a jar file straight into a servlet container directory or dropping in a, a new .NET assembly to hot patch a shared library. So I've given myself the ability to actually manage the risk of the deployment and make sure that I've made the right choice. And if I need to back this out, it's a quick, op quick operation. This is effectively what we often call blue-green deployments. And so once I'm finished, I redirect the link. And then I can turn off the old service. Uh, Jez is going to talk about this later. This is the, believe it or not, the single best picture of Jez I've found on the internet. Uh, he looks even more horrendous in, real, in person. He's got a book called uh, Continuous Delivery. He'll be talking about stuff later on. It'll probably be very good. I don't know. We'll find out later, I guess, Jez. No pressure. It, this is really the best picture of you there is. Um, so blue-green deployments are nice. So I think about my service design. I think about uh, managing the risk of those deployments in, in, in that way. I can deploy my service. I can test it. I can switch over when I'm ready. But there can be challenges that's, that mean maybe constraints in my environment or in the problem space that mean I can't do blue-green deployments in this way easily. Some constraints that you might have in your systems right now that might stop this from happening. Here's a fun one. One of the classic places where we do blue-green deployments are actually with customer-facing websites. So here's my user. He's using the music shop right now. Uh, and of course, he's shopping. He's putting things in his basket. And because as any good uh, enterprise developer, I have read what the vendor told me about how to store baskets rather than looking at the HTTP specification. And so as a result, I am saving the state of my basket actually on the application server. Of course, this is always the best thing you can possibly do. Now I have a situation where I to deploy a new version of the music shop. Now I have to deal with the fact that once I've tested it and smoke tested it and made sure it's happy and I want to redirect my user over, I now have to move that state over as well. So that's problematic. Or I have to decide to kill the state. That then becomes a business decision. There's no real need to do this most of the time. Just use cookies instead. Often people end up using clusters, servlet clusters at this point, which has all kinds of inherent issues in terms of increased network bandwidth, money going to vendors doesn't need to go to vendors. So I would say, in general, avoid stateful services. Store state in the database, I think that's fine, just not in application memory state. It's very hard to make transitions at that point. 
What about expensive hardware? Oh no, we can't afford another box to run your system in parallel on. This is becoming less of a legitimate concern than it was in the past. Um, for those of you using uh, external cloud infrastructure, you're talking potentially about running an overlapping system for an extra couple of hours. That might be a few dollars, depending on how big the system needs to be. But it can still be a legitimate problem. So how can I redeploy my recommendation service with, and keep my system running, thereby limiting the impact of that deployment without requiring more hardware? So one option is to use a manual circuit breaker. So here's my website right now. I've been buying Queens of Stone Age, Take That, and Snoop Dogg. And it's recommended I buy uh, the brakes. The brakes are a great band. I, I always go around telling people they're a great band. So and then here I am running live, and it's all going well. But we find the bug with the recommendation service, and I want to make a deployment. But I want to keep the site running while I make that deployment. But I can't bring up another box. I don't have a spare box to deploy it on. Maybe the size of the service is too big. Maybe it requires specialist hardware. Well, what we can do is effectively put a circuit breaker around the connection between the music shop and the recommendation service. When I want to deploy the service, I blow the circuit breaker. Now, at this point, I need to degrade the quality of service to the front-end website. Now, this is something you need to be considering anyway when designing distributed systems. You need to understand what happens when a service is not available that you depend upon. So in this particular example, we just don't display the recommendations at the moment. Now, this could happen during a normal network outage. Here, it's a purposeful thing. I've blown the connection. This now allows me to deploy the new version on the same hardware as I had before, run my tests. Once I'm happy, I redeploy the service, reset the circuit breaker, and back comes the connection. Now, to an extent, the music shop has to be quite aware that I've severed that connection. Uh, so you have to consider that. But if you've got synchronous downstream connections to services anyway, you need to understand what happens when that service isn't there for accidental reasons, like someone pulling out the power. But here I've had to think very concretely, not just about how one service talks to another, but also about how the user behavior needs to, to be affected and impacted by that sort of deployment. Uh, Mike mentions the circuit breaker pattern in his book. Um, there it's talked about more in terms of a way of managing downstream deployments. You can actually take that manual circuit breaker and make it an automated circuit breaker by putting health checking on it. So for example, if a downstream connection responds sluggishly or doesn't return quickly enough, you can automatically sever that connection. So it's well worth reading Mike's book on that subject. There's another approach, which is to make the connection between your music shop and the recommendation service asynchronous. So in this situation, I'm firing, say, the basket contents out to recommendation service, and I'm expecting a request back to the music shop to say, here's what the recommendation should be. Now here, things are a little bit different. If I take the recommendation service back down, the music shop kind of doesn't know. It's still throwing those requests out. Assuming I've got a persistent queue sitting there, he never needs to know anything's happened. But he does need to know that he hasn't received the response yet. As the requests build up, responses will get slower and slower and stop happening. And at a certain point, again, you still need to degrade the user behavior, or the user's experience, sorry. There is a subtle difference here in terms of what happens for the user, though. In the previous situation, we knew the recommendation server had gone. We knew that was definitely an error state. But with an asynchronous service, it's not always immediately obvious that something's not there and not going to happen versus just being a bit slow. These can have quite subtle impacts on user behavior. So I wouldn't necessarily suggest changing your service-to-service -service communication to being asynchronous purely to allow you to remove these services easily. There are lots of emergent complexities that happen in these sorts of situations. So here I say waiting. I don't know I'm in an error state right now. I just know it's taken longer than I thought it should normally. But nonetheless, once my new service gets deployed, it just starts eating back through those messages, and my recommendations start flowing again. If you already have a service that is, by nature, asynchronous in terms of its communication style, then maybe just using persistent queues allows you to deploy those services fairly freely 
there's a lot of interesting uh, patterns around how you work with uh, asynchronous communications in the enterprise integration patterns book. So it's worth a read if you are doing this stuff a lot. There are some other things to watch for, though, when thinking about your service design. I mean, I've talked here really about how you take a big system and break it up into chunks to allow you to deploy those chunks independently of each other. There are a number, there's a number of anti-patterns that can emerge, though, when you're moving towards these sort of distributed architectures. I'm going to describe a couple to you. Uh, the first one is one called the trifle. I'll explain what trifle is later. So here I am on Music Web Shop, and I've, just, I've gone to Sam's talk, but I fell asleep at this point and thought, the thing I've got to do when I get back home is I need to split my system up. So the first thing I do is I look at my code base and I see a thing called the repository layer and I think, great, that's a perfect place to split my code base into two services. It's already there. I've got an API call. So there I go. My persistence layer is now a separate service. The problem is now when a feature changes, you'll typically find that one change now needs to be applied to two services. Remember what we were trying to achieve by decomposing into services. We're trying to make it quick to make a change and quick to deploy that change and reduce the risk of that change. Now, if I've got to make a change that used to be in one code base and now that same change needs to be applied to two code bases and I now need to deploy two services, I am not better off. I am worse off. And this is a very simple example. Um, they can get worse when you have multiple layers. The other thing that happens here, though, is when you slice services sort of horizontally across arbitrary technical ba um, boundaries, you also tend to find that the communication between those services becomes very, very chatty. You're making multiple calls across the wire. That becomes inefficient and slow to manage. And you'll often also find you want to change those APIs far more than you would normally. And if you've got a giant stack of systems like this, that can get difficult. Now, I did this talk recently in uh, Hamburg, and it was pointed out to me that not everybody knows what a trifle is. So that's a trifle there. You have layers of sort of custard and things. So trifles are bad. That's what you need to know, unless they've got sufficient brandy in them. Uh, we really, we're aiming more, and this is also, you know, if you're German, this is like a Black Forest Gatto. So think of this as the Black Forest Gatto pattern, if that's helpful to you. We want to aim more for sort of a Battenberg cake thing, where there's, this is like hexagonal architecture. There's probably a whole separate talk comparing cakes to architecture patterns. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's marzipan and apricot jam. It's quite tasty. Um, there's another anti-pattern out there, which I see quite a lot which is the spider. So here we are with our CD ordering system. Uh, and there are other services I need to talk to to accomplish my tasks. I have a white mail system, which is not the opposite of black mail. These are often the systems that send letters to people. Letters still do exist. Um, we have a system for doing data warehousing because you need a data warehouse to store your data in, otherwise it gets lost. I don't, I've never seen data come out of a data warehouse system, but it's definitely got to be there, so you've got to send it somewhere. I need a third-party supplier to send me all those Justin Bieber CDs that I'm going to end up ordering after my recommendation system glitch and some finance system to make sure we all get paid. Uh, and what happens at this point is you find out about something called business process modeling or workflow management, and you think, great, what I'm going to do is create a nice flow chart of how my system works. And I'm going to put that, that, that flow chart, that business process modeling somewhere. And of course, I put it in the middle. And so this guy now does all the orchestration. I'm going to do that, then I'm going to do that, then I'm going to do that. And what you end up with is four dumb systems and one giant snag in the middle, the God class. Uh, we had a, a service I, a system I worked on recently, and we had a very simple class called the scheduler. And the scheduler's only job was to trigger jobs at a certain time of day. I went away, came back six months later, and they'd renamed it the director. The director did everything. The problem again now is I want to make a change. I'm probably going to have to change the CD ordering system right in the middle because he knows everything. Why is that a problem? Well, because now this is the most important system in my entire, this is the most important service in my entire system. I'm probably going to change that a lot. And it's the one thing that everything else is reliant on. I haven't reduced the risk. I probably haven't made it faster to make the change either. 
Uh, Ian Robinson, oh, and I was talking to him very early about services and he was trying to understand what a service was. And he had a nice definition he used, which was that a service is a set of capabilities on an endpoint. And talking to him helped me understand what I was doing wrong previously when I was breaking up these services across these arbitrary boundaries or having single god services sitting in the middle. What do we mean by sort of capabilities? set of capabilities at an endpoint. When you see services and components that are well factored, what you actually see are services that are grouped around sort of capabilities that make sense for your domain, your business user. These are business focused capabilities. CD shopper focused capabilities. I might want to add things to a car. I want to check out my basket, viewing the latest releases, searching, listening to previews. These aren't things around an entity or an arbitrary technical distinction. These are things that anybody in the company working on that piece of software, be them a technologist or non-technologist, should understand. And when you start identifying these capabilities as they exist in your system, you can just start grouping them together. So it's kind of like what you're doing with uh, domain-driven design and created bounded contexts. And when you've collected enough of these together, they start becoming effectively the boundaries for your services. The reason this is great is because your communication then becomes focused around what you're trying to achieve with your software. It doesn't become around arbitrary, okay, uh, find, buy, ID, with no, I'm, I'm checking out. I'm placing an order, removing something from my basket. The benefit then becomes is that, well, what do we do when we roll out a feature? Some change we want to give to the customer in this case, some buying CDs, that's going to be a change in how CDs are bought. And that is much, much more likely now, that change is much more likely now to be limited to one or two of these services, not rippling out across the entire system. I often, when doing these exercises with clients, will almost do, if you may remember from university when we talked about object-oriented programming, we did the CRC card exercise where everyone got to pretend to be an object. We did that very enthusiastically for one tutorial and then never did it again. I actually do it for services. Role-playing the exercises. Okay, so I want to achieve this task. So how am I going to achieve that? Well, first I'm going to go to you, and then you're going to go and do this, and then you're going to go and do that. You start to uncover problems in your design very, very rapidly. Have I got snags? Have I got circular dependencies? Are things overly confusing and chatty? You do not need someone very technical to do that if you've got these boundaries correct. That's a very good way of keeping your eye in. Am I factoring these correctly? So really think about modeling your services based on your domain. And I would say your domain's capabilities, so operations, high-level operations, rather than entities. Another real problem, though, when you're breaking up into services is how those services talk to each other. Let's consider some more scenarios. So here I am with my music shop with a recommendation system. Now, if I make an internal change to the recommendation system, maybe a small change, I maybe add some logging statements internally, the interface has not fundamentally changed. As long as I haven't changed the semantics of that interface, I'm fine. The music shop carries on as it was before. Maybe now I add some new API calls, but the old API calls I could make across the wire stay the same. This is now an expansion change. Again, I don't need to redeploy my music shop. The music shop carries on, he's very happy. What we have to deal with are breaking interface changes. These are either fundamentally different APIs or very, very different semantic behavior of an existing call, which is always bad. This is a problem. Because again, if I want to limit the impact of a change and I keep breaking APIs to remote services, I'm suddenly starting to increase the size and the risk of my deployments. How can we manage API change? Well, the first thing is if you're going to introduce a breaking change is consider not introducing the breaking change. That's always good. Um, but consider also having two endpoints. So let's imagine I'm rolling out a new iPhone application, and it needs to communicate in quite a different way. And actually, we've looked at the old version one endpoint, and it's getting quite crafty, and we're not really very happy with it. So we've come up with a nice, much better factored, easier to support API that we So what can I do? Well, just roll out the new endpoint, but have them running side by side. 
I can now release my iPhone application on the new endpoint. I allow other consumers of the old endpoint to continue as they were before, buying them time. So if I have two, three, four, five, ten consumers, they are unaffected by that change. So now I get time to talk to those teams or schedule that change when they do their next release. And then they've, once, once they're ready, we can redirect that change. So that's one thing we can consider doing to limit the impact of interface changes. There are other things that can go very badly wrong, though, when you're talking across a service boundary. This is a classic one that I did about five times before I realized it was a bad idea. Um, two services. Now, of course, I'm communicating. I'm taking some in-memory object state. I'm creating a serialized form of that object state, and I'm sending it over the wire. And the other guy, well, he's got to deserialize that. Now, any good developer who has been raised on don't repeat yourself is immediately thinking, ah, code reuse. And what they do is they create a library. They create a library that can take the in-memory object state, serialize it, deserialize it back into the same object state, because that means less code. They then use that same shared library on two services. So here I am, service A, object serialized, and sent over the wire. Fantastic. And then I go and release a new version of the shared library code and I when I deploy the next version of service A. Can I still send stuff over the wire? Maybe. Maybe not. One system I saw, uh, they had a fairly uh, pervasive shared library representing their domain objects that were shared across four services. They could not reliably guarantee they could deserialize objects when they had different versions of that shared library. It was worse because those, light, those objects were sitting in message buses throughout the system. So when they needed to release a service that needed a new version of that shared library, they had to synchronize deployments of that shared library for the entire system. They had to take all the services down. They then had to have a job that rewrote all the messages on, this, on the message buses and put them back in. So really be aware of shared serialization protocols. So things like Java serialization, WSDL binding can be quite bad uh, at this, uh, things like JAXB. There are some binary serialization protocols that give you a bit more room to maneuver, things like protobufs and thrift. However, they don't really solve all the problems here. And typically, you see people never changing their binary serialization protocols because they are too scared of the impact. Really, the thing we need to embrace here is something that was detailed in RFC 761, which is one of the early TCP IP uh, RFCs. And it's something that's been called uh, Postel's Law, which is be conservative in what you do and be liberal in what you expect. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means if I get sent something and I've got to react to it, don't bind to the whole message unless I need the whole message. Now, with binary serialization, I'm kind of forced into that. I have to unpack everything. And if things are not there that I expect but don't use, I fall over. If I need three fields from a very big SOAP payload, don't bind to the entire schema, because that just increases the surface area of me getting broken by something. Our best practice advice when consuming SOAP services, use XPath. Don't use a whistle binder. Pull out the little bits you need. And then if somebody changed parts of that schema outside of things you care about, you won't even notice. Uh, often when we're doing shared services, we will actually not do code reuse across those services. It can often be significantly better for you just to copy and paste code between services and reuse them and accidentally get yourself in a situation where to deploy one change, you have to redeploy the entire system. This can be very counterintuitive for developers, but believe me, the alternative is far, far worse. Another way you can think, though, about, I mean, I've talked about things you can do to avoid breaking changes. Are there ways you can catch that, though, before you get into production? And the answer is yes, and consumer-driven contracts are a great, great way of avoiding that. So with consumer-driven contracts, here's a music shop is consuming the recommendation service. It has an expectation about the quality of service for that, for that um, downstream service. It expects that when I make this kind of request, I get a response that looks like this. Now, when you're designing these service boundaries, you're having that conversation, maybe within your team, maybe across the team. But often, that, and that becomes an API, and that's often the end of the conversation. 
What if I, we actually codified our expectations of that service as a test? See, so the music shop say, here is what we expect your service to do when I do this. That test then gets run by the recommendation service in their build. So every time the recommendation service makes a change, they go, oh, OK, let's look at our consumer contracts. Let's run them. Did we break them? Oh, we broke them. OK, great. Well, we may have changed our API. We need to go have a talk to the people that are consuming us. Or we need to change what we've done. So this is a great early warning. It allows the recommendation service to keep changing, keep changing, keep changing, knowing they've got that safety net in place that once they go into production, they've done as much as they can do to verify they won't break any other changes. You can be braver then in releasing the change into production. Uh, unfortunately, I've talked about all the easy stuff so far. Um, what I haven't talked about much is databases. The real problem we've got, uh, as any of you may know who've been to the big data tracks, is that data's really, really cool. And it mostly seems to be a volume thing. Like, one gigabyte is definitely better than one megabyte. A terabyte is better than a gigabyte. Uh, a petabyte is awesome. Uh, I'm actually quite looking forward to the, uh, the Hadron Collider data storage talk later on. But clearly, volume is the thing. Uh, we put aside petty concerns like how we might use that data or using it to derive business decisions, because that's crazy talk. But data is very, very cool. The problem is that databases are inherently evil things. And they are evil in the context of making things easy to change. Here's a really, this is probably the most common distributed service anti-pattern we see. Hands down, the most common, and also the most destructive in terms of making it easy to apply changes to your system. My music shop, talking to some database schema. Probably Oracle Rack, because I've got lots of money from selling those Justin Bieber CDs. And I pull out the recommendation service, because that's the important thing, right? But I still keep talking to the same schema really standard stuff. Why is this a problem? Well, if I want to change the music shop now, and maybe I want to change the schema design to support a change to the music shop, can I do that? Kind of might not know. I don't necessarily know what the recommendation service is doing my schema. Am I going to break the recommendation service? Don't know. Equally, if both these services are writing to the same tables, but they have business logic that's different, how do I know I'm going to make my data changes in a consistent fashion? Kind of don't know. At this point, you need to treat almost your database schema as a separate service with a huge undefined API that is SQL. And at that point, you start realizing how bad this is. I would actually advocate, if you are in this situation, you've got two choices. You either start trying to separate out your database schema or you merge the services back. Because this is worse, significantly worse for us. Because what is it we're trying to do? Limit the impact of a change and be able to release effectively and efficiently. I now can't make changes without knowing about the ripple out effect. What we want are separate schemas. The music shop, if it wants to talk to the recommendation service, goes via the service API boundary. Typically, this won't require any more hardware, just a separate schema. Separating them is not always easy, but it can be done, and this is significantly better. So each service should own its own data. Typically, you think in terms of entities being owned by services and having control over the full life cycle of those services. Why is this great? Well, we want to make loads of cool changes to make our services better. Let's imagine now that I've decided that my recommendation service really, really, really needs to move to React because I saw Creston talking about it last year and thought, React is cool. I've got to distribute my data across the world. Um, but I can now free to, I'm now free to make that change because as long as my API doesn't change and the semantics of that API do not change, I am not impacted. Uh, Creston actually outlined a nice approach to how they handle the transition for the medical record system from MySQL to um, React. That's worth dwelling on here. So here I am. I need to re release for React, but I don't want to make that in a big bang change. I don't want to suddenly go, OK, I was now MySQL, and now I'm React. So instead, the first release, 
I dual write. I write my data to both places. But I'm still reading from my relational database management system. Why am I dual writing at this point? I'm dual writing at this point because I want a rollback. Remember, we're trying to make small incremental releases with reduced risk. I want to be able to roll this change back quickly. At this point, if React collapse in a heap, the previous version I can go back to, and I can still have all of my data that I had before. Assuming React holds up, operationally, it's scaling everything else, I can now, reading from, I can now read from React. I'm still writing, though, to my relational database management system. Again, I need a rollback point. And only when I'm ready do I actually need to remove that system. This is kind of a variation on what's often called um, dark launching. Effectively, I've brought up a subsystem without anyone really realizing it. I've been using it in the background, and only when I'm ready do I effectively release that feature to the customers. The interesting thing here is, is that for the point of view of the customer, there may not be any impactful change, but it could be a fairly large-scale change I've made without anyone really realizing what's going on. And this can happen for services too. I come out with a brand new version of my recommendation system. This one's written in Clojure, so it's obviously going to be better and faster, and will definitely not ever suggest that I get Justin Bieber CDs. It's probably like five lines of code compared to like 20,000 lines of Scala in the recommendation service, but here I am. So I make my change, um, and again, I could do it with the services. The recommendations, maybe I send them to both services in production, but maybe I'm only looking at the responses from the recommendation service. I can make sure that it's not, I'm not getting high error rates. I could actually have someone look at a log of the responses and see if these things look sensible in a production setting. And then when I'm ready, I can retire the recommendation service. So we've talked about a few things in this session. I'm under time, I've talked too fast. We've talked about decomposing our system into small units. And doing so, we've talked about modeling the domain. We've talked about how you, when you do that, how you get the interfaces right on your system. And we talked about a number of patterns where we separated the deployment of something from releasing it to our customers. Blue-green deployments, I deployed, then I released a feature. We talked about uh, dark launching. There are lots of reasons why you might want to move towards component-based systems, going from, say, shared, going from nice package structures to module structures to distributed services. That's a fairly sensible progression. By breaking up our system into components, it becomes easier to reason about. If we take that to the logical conclusion, it becomes easy for us then to replace those systems without affecting the overall health of our entire service. There are lots of reasons why we might want to go that route. I might want to split these things up for team reasons, for performance, for scalability, for technology. But ultimately, we need to be thinking as well about how easy it is for us to actually release our system. I used to look through the illities lists that the Software Engineering Institute has, and there was always maintainability. I used to think that maintainability was all about code quality, doing TDD, maybe some functional testing. But maintainability, there's no point in it making it easy for me to make that change if I don't think about how it is that I can make that change in a production setting. And all I think we need to do is, is, is consider that. What do I need to do? How, how, how would it be if I maybe released this feature now? What would happen to my overall system? I've also outlined, though, some approaches that make sense if you need to maintain uptime. Some of you might not have those sorts of challenges. But nonetheless, we're seeing a movement away from large monolithic systems to smaller services talking together, microservices. This is much more viable than it used to be because we have cloud providers that allow us to provision boxes just big enough for our services. We have infrastructure automation technology that allows us to bring these services up and down. And we're getting a lot more experience about why RPC is bad and why REST is good and all those sorts of things. So this has been a whistle-stop tour through some examples of how you can change your architectures, your designs, and your systems in order to make it easier for you to release components. But it's not exhaustive. The key thing is just applying conscious thought. Is the ability to release your software frequently important to you? And if it is, 
think about it a lot more when you make your decisions. Uh, I am a little bit under time, so I do have time for questions. Sure, the question was when integrating services together, I could either make lots of calls across all the services, or I could have a music shop service that pulls these services together to present something to the user. And the question was, what would my preference be? I think when you're going to a web page as a user, that web page has to be hosted somewhere. That is always going to be an integration point for a simple user-facing website. The question really is about how thick or thin that experience might be. And there's a balance between creating a compelling user experience versus you know, decomposing behavior into the systems. So I would think that service at the top needs to be extremely thin. Maybe all it's doing, and effectively you may just be serving back some HTML, some JavaScript, and some CSS. So the music shop may just be responsible for the, you know, the consistent user experience. And then the calls are coming straight from the client back to those end systems. That might not be viable, though, depending on the number of services you have involved. And you may need to be doing some server-side aggregation before serving it back to the customer. I have experimented looking at actually serving up whole snippets of UI from different services and reassembling those. The problem just comes back to how do you maintain a consistent look and feel? If you think about limiting the impact of a change, if I release a change that has a fundamentally different type of user experience, the impact to the user is quite jarring. So probably for a simple website, or a standard customer-facing website, you want something, but it should be very, I think it should be fairly thin and may just be something that, takes, that, that, takes, that sits on that domain and assembles on the client side. If you serve the content that comes back from your services with decent cache headers, you've got the option of doing aggregation in the client or aggregation in the server. You can use reverse proxy CDNs to, to mitigate the risks of those things. So the comment was that you've got lots of SOAP going on, lots of schemas for the messages being passed between the systems, and you're trying to move away from that entirely. Have we seen that elsewhere? Uh, if you mean moving to more lightweight schemas, I mean, when designing what I'm talking, the way one service talks to another service, we just model it in a very lightweight way based on the business itself. Uh, so it should be the payload, you should be able to show that payload to a business user and they should understand what that is. Almost the serialization protocol, is it XML, is it JSON, almost isn't kind of the point. But the key thing is they are very lightweight. And, and certainly I have yet to see any benefit from WSDL has given us other than the ability to very quickly generate a programmatic API that then won't be able to talk to a different programmatic API generated from the same WSDL. Uh, I had lots of fun doing that with talking to British Telecom, for example, and we had to find out the exact point release of Apache Access they had to make our version of Apache Access generate an API that would allow them to talk to each other. So yes, we are seeing people moving away from that type binding to sort of lighter, more informal uh, uh, schemas. The, the key thing is if they're human readable, it's probably very easy for them, for you to write code that can consume them. And if they are based on how your business operates, they're also going to change probably way less than they might if they were just an arbitrary technical message you're sending along. Because developers like Shift F6ing stuff in IntelliJ for no apparent reason other than they've preferred the name of something else. They tend not to do that with business concepts. So the question there was how do you manage changing in the database? So I've got two versions of the service uh, and I've deployed the new version of the service and it still needs to talk to the old database and maybe that version of the service requires a change to the schema. How am I going to run those things side by side? Um, if you need to maintain the system to be in an up state, you may need to phase the deployment of your schema changes. So for example, you could do an expand contract type pattern. So maybe the first thing you need to do is apply a schema change that adds the new database fields, tables, columns you need. Step one. Step two would be deploy the version of the application that uses that new data. And then once you've done that, later on you could apply a second, a third change that removes the old structures. So you sort of expand that database. And you end up having to phase it effectively into three releases. Many of the organizations that practice quite frequent release cycles, thinking of the Etsy's, the, the Flickers of the world, 
they may be releasing service, changes to component services multiple times a day. They are not doing the same thing for database changes when those databases are shared. The key thing is that becomes significantly more problematic if different types of services are talking to the same database. If you can segment that and have services that own their own database, you at least slim down the, that complexity to when you have a schema change here. But a schema change here doesn't need to affect a service over here but you may need to phase it. You need to think very carefully about how you do database changes, and there's no way around that, especially for those systems which, where the schema is in the database. I would also argue that this problem does not go away with so-called schemaless data, uh, data stores like Mongo. Um, you do have a schema. It's just an implicit schema in your application code. You are choosing to name a field a certain thing. And if you've got two versions of the services and you're calling those, thi those, service, those fields different things, you have the same sort of issue going on. We're at time. Uh, well, thank you very much. I'll be around all day if you've got any questions. And the slides and video will be up soon. Thank you. <laughs>